Today we're going to be talking about being faithful in service. So I need you guys to be with me in this. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Oh, man. Worship was... You guys had your Wheaties or something. You guys... I'm excited. I'm excited. So before we do, I'm going to start off with a story. A story. So I want you to pay close attention. So uh, when I was younger, I played a lot of video games. I played a whole lot of video games. When I got older and into my 20s, I still played a whole lot of video games. And one day, I met a beautiful girl by the name of Haley. And Haley started coming over to my house all the time, hanging out. And I would hang out with my friends and her in the basement. And we would sit there and play video games. And she would sit there and watch me play video games. (laughs) She would sit there and watch me play video games. And she was like, she's like a dream girl. She's like into sports, all these different things. She'll watch ESPN. She'll do anything. But my dad, over weeks and weeks and weeks, he keeps walking by the door in the basement and looking down and seeing her sitting next to me while I'm playing video games. And one day he had the grace to pull me aside and say, what are you doing? You are out of your mind. This girl is pretty. She's nice. She likes sports. And you're making her sit there because you're always playing video games. You're always playing video games. So you need to stop and do something to make this girl want to stay. So I took his counsel and I went out and I bought another Xbox so we could play video games together. Because I didn't want her just sitting there. <laughs> Lord, help me. So here's my question to you. What would you say or what would other people say that you are always doing? What would other people say that you are always doing? Are you always encouraging people? Are you always complaining? Are you always the person that's digging up gold in people's lives and finding good? Or are you always finding fault? What would others say that you are always doing? Are you always at work? Are you always at the gym? Are you always scrolling on Instagram? Are you always sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? What would others say that you are always doing? Now this series, it revolves around this idea of being selfless instead of selfish. But we live in a self-centered, selfish, self-promoting culture. Self-promoting culture. So I did something. I went on Google and I Googled the term self-promotion and I was blown away at what I found. Article after article after YouTube video after podcast telling you how to be good at self-promoting. How to get really good at self-promoting. So I'm going to name a couple of these articles. The first thing that I found that I thought was interesting is the art of self-promotion. Six ways to get your work discovered. Forbes wrote an article that says self-promotion is a skill. Self-promotion is a skill. And by today's standards, if you get on the internet, you get on YouTube, you get on Instagram, you get anywhere, self-promotion is a skill, a skill to be desired. The third thing that I found is this one, and I think this one is the most interesting one. It says 40 ways to self-promote without being a jerk. (laughs) 40 ways to self-promote without being a jerk. Because, you know, that's kind of our fears. We want people to love us. We want people to recognize us. But we don't want to be that person that's always like, hey, I'm here in my garage with my Lamborghini. Let me tell you how I got rich. I read 40 books a day. I'm a genius. No, 40 ways to self-promote without being a jerk. It's a skill, and the world tells us that we need to get good at it. It's pervasive. It's, it's just flowing through every fiber of our society right now. And the world says, this is a skill, and you have to get good at it. Right now, if you don't believe that, A survey said that 56% of teens want to be one thing, famous. They want to be a celebrity. They want to be a YouTube star or a personality. They want to be a musician that is desired to be looked at. And you know, hey, I'm I'm right there next to him. I believe that that's, that's an effective communication tool But if you live here, I'm going to use a term that people use here a lot. I don't know if they use them in other parts of the world. But they say, I want to be the goat. I want to be the goat. Do you know what that means? 
We have somebody that is the goat that is from Louisville. I am the greatest. I'm the greatest of all time. We want to be the greatest of all time in anything and everything that we do. But the problem is, is Jesus is diametrically opposed. He's completely opposed to this ideology. He's completely opposed to this train of thought. And you go, oh, well, you know, Jesus wants us to do great things. He wants to bring us great things. Look at this little, this little light wants to be the greatest, man. (laughs) Trying to outshine me. Laser sounds and lights. It's the Holy Spirit, man, telling you what. But really quickly, I want to read from the book of Matthew. And this is chapter 23 and verse 11. And this is what Jesus has to say if you want to be the greatest. The greatest among you will be your servant. Woo. Interesting. Yes. Yes. Woo is right. The greatest among you will be your servant. Sometimes we look at service and we say, ah, oh, service is something that I go to. Service is something that I do once a year on Christmas. Maybe I'll be nice to a family and I'll throw a little bit of money in the plate. And that's my service. And I'm here to tell you that service isn't something that you do. A servant and service is who you are. As a Christian, the greatest among you will be your servant. We have to have a heart for service. So I want you to do something with me really quickly. I want you to focus in, close your eyes, and I want you to say these words as I say them. I want you to repeat after me. Say, I am a servant of the Most High God. When I serve others, I am serving Christ. I am a servant of the Most High God. When I serve others, I am serving Christ. What? are others saying that you are always doing? What are people saying that you are always doing? I want to read a story really quickly. It's just a quick little blip, and this is from the book of Acts. This is 9 and 36 from the NIV. And there's this woman. Her name is Joppa. It, or, well, in, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, and, get this, in, her, in Greek, her name was Dorcas. Uh, man, I don't know who was picking out Bible names But like, God had to have a sense of humor or something. But Dorcas, the Bible says that she was always doing good and always helping the poor. The Bible says that Dorcas was always doing good and always helping the poor. And the thing is, Dorcas, she was actually the first woman, the first Greek woman in the New Testament mentioned at all. And her name, Dorcas, as funny as that might seem to us, actually means gazelle. So she may have been a a beautiful woman with a long neck and long legs. Who knows? But, but, But Dorcas was always doing good and always helping the poor. She was always helping other people that weren't her. She was always sewing clothes for people that needed clothes. The Bible says that she was always reaching out and helping widows, people that didn't have much, people that didn't have a lot. She was doing it. But, but, Here's something that happened. Dorcas, Dorcas died. Dorcas died, but God had another plan. God, through Peter, brought Dorcas back to life. And through her life, through her life, a revival broke out. And many, 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 many people came to Christ because they saw a woman that served over and over and over and over and over. And it's remarkable that the Bible even mentions her because not only was she a woman, but she wasn't a Jewish woman. Very, very, very important. Instead of always serving herself, she was always serving others. And through that, she was always serving Jesus. So the question is, is how do I become a faithful servant? How do I become like Dorcas? How do I become a faithful servant? Because I, I don't have, man, I walked in here today and Cher was singing and I leaned over to my brother and I said, I, sometimes I forget, I forget just how good Shara can sing. I forget just how good she can sing because I'm always listening to other things and I have headphones in, but man, what a gift. And some of us might go, oh, I can't sing like Shara. Or man, I can't 
preach like Pastor Randy, or I don't have a vibrant personality, how do I become a faithful servant? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share three images from the Bible, three stories from the Bible that's going to help us understand how we can become better servants. So the first thing is this. The first thing is bring a lunch. Bring a lunch. Whoa. Why do we let this guy preach? <laughs> bring a lunch. The second thing, the second image is offer a ride. Offer a ride. And the third thing is carry a towel. Carry a towel. But we're going to focus first on the idea of bringing a lunch. Bringing a lunch. Say, bring a lunch. Bring a lunch. Awesome, awesome. So this is the story about King David. This is a story about King David. King David was a war hero, and he actually rose to notoriety because he slew a giant by the name of Goliath. But David, who was a great king, a great warrior king, would go out to battle with his armies, and he would come back into town, and the people would, would line the streets and celebrate when David would come back. The Bible actually says that women would sing songs about how great David was as he would ride by on his horse. Oh, David, you're so strong and your muscles are so oily. You look so good. You look just like that guy that played Aquaman. Oh, oh, David. Like one day I'm hoping that when I get done preaching one day, I'm gonna walk inside my house and my wife is gonna be like, Jaron preached a good message. He's so attractive. I'm waiting for the day it's gonna happen. It's going to happen. I declare. I declare. Oh. But here's the quick question. Why was David great? Was David great because he won the battle? I propose to you that David was great because he brought a lunch. David was great because he brought a lunch. He didn't get promoted in the kingdom because of the battles that he won. He got promoted in the kingdom because he was a servant. David spent years in the field tending the sheep, playing music for kings. Whatever God had for him, he would do it. So really quickly, here's what I'd like for you to do. David was, was the son of a man, and he was the youngest out of eight brothers. All his brothers went off to war. They were preparing to fight this battle, a battle that ended like this. And David wanted to go. But David was tending the sheep. David was eager to get to battle. But let's read this really quick. Put up 1 Samuel for me really quickly. And let's read what it says. It says, one day Jesse, which was David's father, said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. Take this basket. Take it to your brothers. Serve them. Serve your brothers. So, if you want to win the battle, sometimes first you have to bring the lunch. If you want to win a battle, first you have to bring the lunch. I remember one time, I'm not going to mention names, but one time we had this service where we gave multiple people the opportunity to come up and share a word. Uh, and one of the people got up and instead of just delivering a word, they declared, I'm going to sing a song as well. And they weren't guided to do that, but they did it and it was real weird. Because they got up and then they sang and then they delivered their message and we were like, oh, you weren't supposed to do that. You were just asked to bring the lunch, but you're trying to slay the giant and do what you saw in your mind. I have spent years doing other things in this church. This is not just what I do, especially if you're new here. I would like for you to know that. People have been so kind to me. People have been so kind to me when I get up and I speak because the truth is I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just kind of like up here flying around by the seat of my pants. But people have been very, very kind to me. One of the most interesting compliments that I had not too long ago is I walked up to somebody and they took me by the shoulders and they said, oh, Jaron, oh, Jaron. Over all these years, I never thought it would be you. <laughs> I never thought it would be you. And I'm like, don't worry, I thought that it wouldn't be me either. I thought that it wouldn't be me either. But I spent years, Jaron, will you sing in the choir? Yes. Jaron, 
would you like to learn how to play drums? Yes. And then one day, there's nobody else at church, and it's a Wednesday night, and my dad says, I have an emergency, everybody's out of town, will you preach? And I, yes, exactly. <laughs> Nervous laughter. Nervous laughter. Yeah, yes. Yes, I will. And I had 24 hours to prepare, man, and I prepared. I thought it was good. And I got up, and I preached, and it was real quiet. <laughs> it was really, really quiet. It was, hold on, just let it be awkwardly quiet for like five seconds. The whole service. The only amen section that I had was, bless him, Lord. <laughs> bless him, Jesus. But I had to say yes. I had to bring a lunch. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, first thing, bring a lunch. First thing is bring a lunch, all right? Awesome. Because that's what God wants to see. If you want the opportunity to slay the giant, God wants to see if you'll bring a lunch first. God wants to see if you'll bring a lunch first. It's so true. It's so true. The second thing is this. Offer a ride. Say, offer a ride. Man, you guys could preach this message for me. So, 553 years before the event that I'm about to speak uh, about took place, a guy by the name of Zechariah, who was a prophet, prophesied that the king, Jesus, would ride into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. Can you imagine that? That had to blow people's minds because the king that's going to come and reinstate who we are as a people is going to ride it. He's like, and God is going to come, and he's going to redeem us as a people, and he's going to ride into the city on a donkey. And people are probably like, don't know about that last part, Zechariah. That's a little weird. You have to think about that, man. That's shocking to the people. That's like, like the president of the United States comes in with an entourage. He has armored vehicles surrounding him. He's riding in a stretch limo. I know some of you guys can probably imagine this, but like Donald Trump on a moped. <laughs> like that's like, that's like, that's the equivalent in our mind because we imagine our king, our king is going to be riding in with flowing robes, a crown, and like, <laughs> pull it together, people, pull it together. All right. But you, you have to think about this. Like a king is going to ride into town on a white horse with flowing robes an entourage. Richard Goodwin, pull it together, man. I'm trying to preach here. <laughs> Lord, help us all. Lord, help us all. But he's not going to be riding in on a donkey. He's going to have an entourage, a white horse. People are going to be celebrating, and it's not going to be on a moped. It's not going to be on a donkey. But Jesus fulfills this prophecy. Jesus turns to his disciples, and he says, the day has come. Secure a donkey. And they're like, uh, what? Really quickly, go ahead and put up uh, Luke 19 for me. It says, if anyone asks you why you're untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Say that the Lord needs it. So the disciples go, they find this donkey, they begin untying it, and the man that owns the donkey asks him, he says, why are you untying it? And they say, well, the Lord needs it. And this is where it gets interesting because this man that owns this donkey doesn't say anything. He lets them take the donkey. He gives it. He gives it. Now this donkey, the Bible actually remarks that this donkey was set aside. This was a donkey that had never been sat on before. It was a low mileage donkey. Like, <laughs> It had never been sat on before. It had never been used. It was set aside probably for sacrifice. It was pure and set aside. So this guy had spent time setting this aside. If kids are trying to climb on it, whatever. No, 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 no. This is my prized possession. This is my sacrifice to God. So he sets it aside, never ridden, pure, but he gave it willingly. But this is where I think we pause because someone says, hey, could you give me a ride? And we stop and we calculate the cost. We say, uh, what's it gonna cost me to serve you? Because I have shows later on tonight on Netflix that I really wanna watch. Hey, 
My buddy's car just broke down. I'm going to be at work in the morning. He needs to get in the work. I know it's your day off. I know it's your day off. Could you give him a ride? <sighs> ah, that's my me time. That's my me time. That's my day where I treat myself. If you want to serve others and in turn serve God, you have to stop calculating the cost. You have to stop calculating the cost if you want to start serving God. Mm. I know this is good because it's real quiet. Y'all are thinking the Holy Spirit is working on the inside of you right now. If you want to start serving Jesus Christ, you have to stop calculating what it's going to cost you. So, you want to be like Jesus, you bring a lunch, and you offer a ride. The third thing that I wanted to talk about is this. You have to carry a towel. This is my favorite example. You have to carry a towel. I love this story. So just before Passover, it's Thursday night. The disciples of Jesus are having a meeting, a secret meeting in the upper room, and Jesus knows. He knows that he's about to deliver information to them. He says, I'm, I'm going to die for everyone's sins. But what are the disciples doing? The disciples are arguing. They're arguing about one thing. When Jesus, man, he's here. Have you guys seen him? He's laying hands on people. He's walking on water. He's doing all these crazy things. He is going to rise to power. But my question is, who's going to be the goat? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? And you know in your mind, in your imagination, it had to be a ludicrous conversation because you have Peter, Peter who is like, well, Jesus loves me the most. Jesus, oh, beloved Peter. Like sometimes it aggravates me when I read Peter's gospel because he wrote it and he's like, Peter, the disciple that Jesus loved the most. So in this argument, in this conversation, he's sitting there and he's like, hey guys, come on, you know, you know I'm going to be the greatest because Jesus loves me. You know that song, Jesus loves me, this I know? I wrote that. (laughs) Like, he loves me the most. And Peter's like, are you kidding me? I heard you singing your little song while we were in the boat and the waves were thrashing around and I saw Jesus and guess what I did? I stepped out and I walked on the water and Bartholomew's like, but you only took three steps and you sank. You sank. And then Bartholomew's like, but you, what about me, guys? You guys remember when I... Actually, nobody remembers anything about Bartholomew. They're like, are you a disciple? Are you even a disciple? <laughs> the conversation had to be ludicrous. Who's the goat? Who's the greatest of all time? And Jesus is sitting at the table, and he looks across, and he sees two things. Two things Jesus sees. He sees proud hearts and dirty feet. Jesus sees proud hearts and dirty feet. So go ahead and put up John really quickly for me. So Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. I want to pause for just a second right here. This, this towel and this robe, he puts on is meant for a servant or a slave. He wraps a towel around his waist and after that he pours water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples. He begins to wash the feet of the disciples. Now this is a scandalous act and the disciples would react hopefully how we would react which is Jesus what are you doing? Stop, 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 stop. You're the king here. You're the great and mighty one. Why are you washing our feet? That's meant for servants. That's meant for slaves. Because we think, oh, well, why is that such a big deal? Well, man, first off, feet are nasty. Feet are gross. But back then, people walked with sandals, open-toed shoes. They would walk through the dirt, and they would share streets with cattle, horses, which meant they were probably also walking through poop and pee. So they would gather around a table, and it was customary that a host would bring in guests, and they would have their servant or their slave wash their guests' feet. That's just as common as something like, hey, hey, Gary, you coming over, hanging out, man? Let me take your coat. 
Let me, can I have a seat, man? Can I get your, can I, can I get you a drink? Do you want a pedicure? No, no, no. But that's like literally, this is a part of the system back then. But it's a role meant for a what? Servant. It's a role meant for a servant. It's nasty though. It's gross. Feet are nasty. My feet are like this long and my toes are this long. My wife, she loves every part of me. She, she does. She, she says, I love you. I love you from the top of your head to the bottom of your ankles, Jaren. You're so, I'm just kidding. She loves all of me. No, no, no. Like, my wife loves every part, but feet are weird. Feet are weird. Um, but what does Jesus do? He looks across the table and he sees proud hearts and dirty feet. And Jesus bends down and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now, here's the question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Because the Bible tells us that he is the Lamb of God. He is the righteous one. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Alpha, the Omega. He is the beginning, the end. He is the righteous one. He is our Savior. He is our foundation. He is our rock. He's our salvation. But what does he do? He takes on the role of a servant. He washes feet. Because Jesus in this moment is teaching us one thing. If you're going to look like me, if you're going to walk like me, if you're going to talk like me, you're going to act like me, you don't come, you don't come to be served. You don't show up at the table to be served. If you come in here and you lift your hands today and you say, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. What you're saying is, I'm not coming to be served. I'm coming to be a servant. I'm coming to be a servant. Why don't my musicians come really quickly? So, Jesus tells us one more thing in Matthew 25. He paints an image for us. And he says... So, one day, when eternity comes, the king is going to sit on the throne. He's going to sit on the throne, and this is what he's going to do. He's going to take the goats, like a shepherd. He's going to take the goats and the sheep, and he's going to put the goats on his left, and he's going to put the sheep on his right. And to the goats, unfortunately, he's going to look at them, and he's going to say, Man, I'm sorry. I know that you wanted to be great. I know that you, well, let's just leave it there, but I didn't know you. I didn't know you. I didn't know you. And then he's gonna turn to the sheep and he's gonna say, welcome, welcome to the kingdom of God. Because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in need, you clothed me. When I didn't have a place to stay, guess what? You let me in. You let me in. When I was in need, when I felt like no one loved me, you loved me. When I felt like no one cared, you cared. Gary, you remember that coworker that couldn't get around and couldn't walk and couldn't mow their lawn and they couldn't trim their hedges anymore and their house was overgrown. And you gathered people up around the church and you said, let's go, let's go. Let's do this for them. That was me, Gary. That was me. Gaius and Cheryl, all those new people that walked through the door and looked like they didn't have a friend. They needed guidance. They needed a mother and a father. And they felt lost and they didn't know what they were going to do in life. And you stepped in. 
you weren't just doing it to them, you were doing it to me. I've got some favorite servants here at Believer's Church that I love. I love everybody here, but man, David Briscoe, nobody is going to see the nights that you lost sleep getting punched in the face at the jailhouse, only to come in here to make sure that these screens worked, to fall asleep back there at the keyboard because you haven't slept in two days. Over and over and over and over and over. Laura Smith, I don't know where you are if you're here, but Laura has spent countless hours creating a year's worth of curriculum just to teach our kids about the love of Jesus Christ after a long day at work. Laura, you didn't just do it to those kids. That kid that was unruly and angry and frustrated, but you kept loving them and you didn't even know that they were getting abused at home. But when you loved them, you were loving me. But I'm not a great singer. I'm not a great preacher. I'm not a great this or I'm not a great that. In the kingdom, in the kingdom, the big things are the little things. In the kingdom, the big things are the little things. So you want to be great. You want to do great things in the kingdom of God. You want your life to have meaning. You want it to have purpose. You want to be fulfilled. Bring a lunch. Bring a lunch. Offer somebody a ride. Stop calculating the cost of your sacrifices. Stop trying to rack up the most hours spent watching Netflix. Stop calculating your loss and start calculating someone else's gain. Start calculating someone else's gain. And if you really want to be selfless, if you want to be successful this year, great, read your blogs, do everything that you think that you need to do. But if you do one thing above everything else, carry a towel and serve like Jesus. Serve like Jesus. Mm. Because the final day is going to come and we're going to stand before the throne and he's going to say one thing, well done, my good and faithful well done, my good and faithful I think you got it. I think you got it. 2020 is not about you. And it's not about me. It's about being Jesus Christ to somebody else. It's about saying, you know what? I am going to do things differently. But I'm going to do it with less of me and more of Jesus. I'm going to do it with less of me and more of Jesus. I'm going to do it with other people in mind. I'm going to make sure that if that person isn't loved by anybody else, they're going to be loved by me. They are going to feel the love of Jesus Christ through me. And when I get frustrated or upset or angry or I start thinking about myself or I need rest, I need a me day. You know what that person needs more than you getting your rest day? The love of Jesus Christ an encounter with the love of Jesus Christ. They need the opportunity to know the great creator who made them with a purpose and a design that they are called to fulfill. So let's stand. Let's stand and pray really quickly. God, you said in your word that the greatest among us will be a servant. The greatest among us will be a servant. So in our hearts today, in our minds today, let something happen. Let something transform. Let Believer's Church begin to transform into a church that is full, not of consumers, 
but a church that is full of people that want to be Jesus to other people. Jesus, change our hearts. God, change my heart. Make my heart like yours. Renew a right spirit within me.